grace and mercy and peace be yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn our attention to this opening section of Paul's letter to the Colossians, the epistle lesson, which we have heard. Dear friends in Christ, what would it be like if God actually inspired somebody to write a letter and send it to our congregation and it arrived via a special courier. What do you think we would do with that letter? Maybe uh, call up the Chamber of Commerce, the mayor, probably the officials of Joplin and Neosho and maybe even Springfield and we'd, we'd tell them that we've got this special letter just for us from God. You think we might set up a special high tech case for it the way they have the Declaration of Independence housed in the Smithsonian Institution? I wouldn't be surprised if we'd want to do something like that. Well, God has sent letters to our congregation. God sent this letter, the epistle to the Colossians, also to our congregation. Of course, he first sent it to the Colossians, but God intentionally had it recorded in such a way that it was bound together into his holy scriptures with the other epistles so that it would be read by every congregation, every Christian congregation everywhere. And this particular letter to the Colossians has some things that, that set it apart as a special, con a special letter for a congregation like ours that you'll hear about. But in this epistle, in the opening part of the epistle, it starts with the Apostle Paul talking about how he prays for this, how he prayed for this congregation in Colossae. And so it sets a good pattern that we can follow as we think of a prayer for our own congregation. The first part of that prayer is thanksgiving to God, and the second part are specific petitions that the Apostle Paul prayed to God. So one of the unique things about this particular congregation that kind of ties it together with ours is that this is actually a congregation that the Apostle Paul had neither started nor actually personally visited. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Paul did train the pastor who was in Colossae, namely Epaphras. So our congregation kind of fits together with Colossae in a way. Just as Paul wrote to the Colossians whom he'd never met, so also we can understand what kinds of things Paul might have written to our Carthaginian congregation. Well, of course, what Paul has to say here, he says to every Christian congregation. The closest Paul got to Colossae was the two years he spent working in Ephesus, about a hundred miles away. Ephesus was on the coast of Greece. And during those two years he was there, the, the book of Acts reports the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power, which explains to us how the Colossian congregation got started. So how exactly had the word of the Lord spread? Well, Christians from Ephesus naturally took the gospel with them wherever they went and shared it. And since Ephesus was a harbor city, people were passing through. They were coming there to buy goods that had arrived by ship. They were coming by to ship out their own goods. They were coming by to travel. And naturally, they bumped into Christians. Some of them then heard the gospel and came to faith in Jesus. And it still works that way, you know. 
the gospel spreads naturally because telling people the gospel does or at the very least ought to come naturally to Christians as naturally as breathing. If you know how to get to heaven and other people don't, if you know there is a savior that can guarantee you the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, well how can you keep that to yourself? And if you tell people these things, you can count on this, that the Holy Spirit works through the word of God and gives it power. In fact, Paul said the gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. And he also wrote that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so the word of God spread naturally out from Ephesus to Colossae and elsewhere. But the gospel also spreads intentionally and ought to as well. Paul helped train Epaphras as a pastor. And it was Paul who encouraged him to go out from Ephesus to other places to share the gospel very intentionally. And the same thing is also true today. It spreads naturally as we let our lights shine by how we speak and how we live, but also very formally and intentionally as we join with other congregations to train pastors and also to send some of them out as missionaries. God's word never returns to him empty. It's always effective. That doesn't mean it always leads to faith. You heard last week Jesus told the 72 that there would be towns that rejected them and they would have to shake the dust off of their sandals. But that doesn't make God's word less powerful. And there are other times when through the gospel the gospel brings people to faith. The spirit works through it. And so it was at the time when Paul wrote this letter everywhere where uh, where they were in the Mediterranean region. Paul says the gospel is bearing fruit and growing in the entire world just as it also has been doing among you from the first day you heard it and came to know the grace of God in truth. You learn this from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. One tells another, one trains another. Paul trained Epaphras, just as he had trained other pastors, one of whom joins him in writing the letter, namely Timothy. Paul also trained Titus. Think about our own congregation. We have two sons of the congregation serving in full-time ministry. They received at least part of their training here in our congregation. We've got Titus serving uh, St. Paul's in Clintonville, Wisconsin. We've got Julius serving St. Paul's in Saginaw, uh, Michigan. And now we have another son of the congregation Kareem at the end of his pastoral training now serving as a vicar in Port Orchard, Washington. All of them got part of their early training right here in our congregation in Carthage, Missouri. And we are the ones who encourage them to take the gospel from us and to spread it further. That's what happens with the gospel. The gospel is such fantastic news, we can't keep it a secret that Jesus has established an eternal kingdom of grace, that in that kingdom there is complete forgiveness of sins, and that all who belong to that kingdom, those who believe in Jesus, will live forever, just as he has risen from the dead. And so Paul starts his letter to the Colossians by telling them that he always prays a prayer of thanksgiving for them. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. 
because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. You have already heard about this in the word of truth, the gospel that is present with you now. So Paul is thankful that when the people in Colossae heard the word of God from Pastor Epaphras, that they came to faith and believed in Jesus. He's also thankful to God that they demonstrated love, sincere love for one another as a result of their faith. And he finally, thirdly, gives thanks that they will spend eternity together with him and with all the saints in heaven forever. Well, Paul could say that very same prayer of thanks for us. And we can join in that prayer of thanksgiving. So give thanks personally that, that the word of God was used by the Holy Spirit to, to ignite faith in your heart. That's a gift from God. Thank God that he brought you to faith. But then also, you've got people next to you. Thank God that he brought them to faith too so that we are not alone in this. It's not just me and God. It's God and us together. And thank God that he has brought other people all over the world to faith we don't just go it alone. In fact, we walk together with others in our synod and in our fellowship. Think of the things that we can do together that we can't do alone. For example, as a synod, we, we support this wonderful college, Bethany Lutheran College, where our young people can go and learn all of the subject matter that is that is taught at a university. They learn it better than at most universities and they learn all of it in the light of the word of God and our faith in Christ. And think also of what we can do when we stand together with our fellow missions around the world. Not just the big ones and the flashy ones, but but those isolated churches that are holding the line against a very brutal and secularized world like our sister churches in Europe, in Sweden, in Latvia, our mission church in Czech Republic, or the, the church in Japan, the small church of our fellowship in Taiwan. We stand side to side with them and can do things together that includes us showing our love for them and reminding them that they are not alone. Wouldn't it be nice if, if an outsider said of our congregation what outsider Paul said of the Colossian congregation? Namely, I give thanks because of this wonderful love that you have for all the saints. Jesus gave an example of what that love looks like in the extreme when he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. And of course, only Jesus fits the description of the Good Samaritan perfectly. Only Jesus is that totally selfless and generous. Nevertheless, what Jesus was telling that expert in the law is this is something that every Christian wants to strive for, to be more and more like him. Like Paul, I give thanks when I remember this congregation in my prayers. We are small, and we are weak, and we're certainly imperfect, of course. But nevertheless, we love one another, and we all share in the same hope. Together we believe in Jesus Christ just like the Colossians and therefore we share the same hope of heaven. And together we want to share the good news with others. Paul knew how to pray. He knew that a good prayer starts with thanksgiving. 
But he also knows that God promises to hear our petitions when we ask him for good gifts. And so he continues, For this reason, from the day we heard about your love, we also have not stopped praying for you. We keep asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you might live in a way that is worthy of the Lord. The Colossian congregation faced some real challenges. It was still a relatively young congregation and yet at that same time this this young congregation was facing some some new temptations and hardships, which is why Pastor Epaphras had come to Rome where Paul was imprisoned to visit him and to discuss his situation back in Colossae. So Paul sent this letter then back to the Colossians with their pastor, Epaphras. And what Epaphras reported to Paul was the the growth of these new sects called the mystery religions which had come to Colossae. These were particularly uh, devilish and tempting in that they, they took things from Christianity, they took the name of Jesus and then they blended it with secret rituals and secret knowledge that would be revealed to you. It was kind of like the Mormons or the, the Masonic Lodge. And so Epaphras came to ask Paul advice about that. And this is why Paul includes a testimonial for Epaphras building up his bona fides and credentials. So he writes, you heard and understand God's grace in all its truth. You learned this true gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And Paul's words are also timely in modern America. As we face modern Gnosticism and postmodern spiritualism, we're surrounded by secularization. And just as predicted, the love of many is growing cold. We're personally also tempted in our post Christian anything goes world to live in ways that are not worthy of the Lord. And even churches today in some cases are teaching that anything goes. Therefore, Paul wants, wanted to pray for the Colossians, and we, like Paul, should pray for our own congregation and the churches of our fellowship with the same petition Paul uses, namely, that God would fill us with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. As we devote ourselves to reading, learning, and taking to heart the word of God in Bible classes, in sermons, and daily devotions at home, God will answer our prayer for wisdom and spiritual understanding. And he will also ignite in our hearts the desire to show love to one another. The kind of love that gets an outsider like Paul to stand up and take notice. Boy, those folks really are filled with love. And it's also through the word that God will build us up in our zeal to remain steadfast in the one true faith, come what may. As Paul summarized, our goal is that you please him by bearing fruit in every kind of good work and by growing in the knowledge of God as you are being strengthened with all power because of his glorious might working in you. Then you will have complete endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. And we will stumble at times, both as individuals and as a congregation, but no matter 
Paul concludes, because he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought him into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God has written letters to us, to Faith Lutheran Church, each letter to a church that God caused to be included in the canon of scripture is a letter that God has written to us. He wants us in these letters, in this letter in particular, to be reminded of who we are, where we came from, what God has made of us now, where we are going together so that we are encouraged along that road to trust in him completely for forgiveness, but then also to to follow him as he leads us to show love and to share his word. May God continue to bring about that good work in us, his congregation here. Amen.